absolutely nothing. That's because these guys prefer to communicate silently through facial expression and body posture. Now, they're also quite the track stars as they can run up to 30 miles per hour in as little as three seconds, earning themselves the nicknames the Greyhounds of the Savannah. Looks like we've already made it to the entrance of our amazing, our beautiful, our exotic Habari Preserve. What in the world? Liz, is that you? I know we don't do this tour anymore. I know you like the movie. I am so sorry. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> we don't do that tour anymore. Still trying to find the other interns. It's okay. Everything's fine. I promise. I, I think. I Anyway, we're going to keep all those arms, legs, wings, and tails tucked inside of the vehicle for me as we go through this part of the preserve. We do have some bird species and some antelope species out here, so make sure to keep your eyes peeled for both. I'm looking, and I do see some birds up ahead, but I'm trying to see if there's anything closer I can point out. I do see actually off the passenger or the driver's side here. I do see some another bird species. These are African crown cranes walking around over here. These guys get their name from the beautiful patch of feathers there on their head. They have one of the loudest calls in the savannah, reaching up to three miles away. But do not be fooled because they're also incredible dancers. When they're younger, they dance to help create social norm and norms, and when they're older, to attract a mate. Now these birds here off the driver's side, kind of in front of us, these are marabou stork. Now they actually lack a voice box, so how they prefer to communicate is through a sack that sits on their neck. It's called a gular sack. They'll inflate and deflate that sack to help create a croaking noise there. It looks like we have found our first antelope species here, right off the driver and passenger side. These guys are East African bongos. Now, these, there are fairly large antelope species that cinnamon color with those white stripes going down helps to break up their body shape so that way predators can't tell where they begin or where they end. Now, these guys do communicate very similarly to another member of the Bovidae family. Does anyone know what sound a cow makes? What sound does a cow make? Moo. Moo. Way to go. You just communicated with a bongo. They also moo. Now, take a look way there in the back. You'll see that other slightly smaller antelope species back there. That's a yellow-backed diker. No, they're about hip high, that charcoal color, with a yellow stripe of fur going down its back. This is important if they ever feel threatened or endangered, they will spike up that yellow fur, kind of creating a bit of a danger mohawk, telling other yellowback diker in the area to stay away from danger. Now, some of the animals in this part of the preserve are critically endangered, like the bongos. They are, there's only about 150 of them left out in the wild. So, Professor Ron partners with something called the Species Survival Plan. Kind of works like a matchmaking service for the animals. It allows scientists to pair together the most genetically diverse pairs, so that way they can create the most genetically diverse offspring, upping the population here in human care and releasing them into the wild, so that way we can have species like bongos for years to come. Alrighty, now if you take a look off to the passenger side, you'll spot a very prehistoric looking bird. This is Miss Odette. She is a shoe bill stork. Now she can stand two, super tall and still like that for hours at a time because she is an ambush predator. It's how she hunts for her food. Now she'll use that beautiful bill of hers to communicate. She can clatter it so quickly and so loudly it is often mistaken as a helicopter rotor. Now, do not be fooled by her name, because she is actually more closely related to a pelican than she is a stork. All right, as we head through these gates, let's make sure we keep those arms, legs, wings, and tails tucked inside of the vehicle for me for your safety. We do have some elephants out here on the preserve, and if they were to make it in here and have access to all of this vegetation, it would be gone in about two hours. We're heading into the Iduri Rainforest where Professor Ron works with the Okapi Conservation Project to help conserve and protect the Iduri Rainforest and all of its elusive inhabitants. Now, Professor Ron did say he was going to meet us here, so let's see if we can catch on up with that professor. Hey, Professor, I got the... <laughs> you guys, he's not here. Oh, goodness. It looks like he was here, though. I do see his jacket. I'll give him a call and see where he is. Professor Ron, this is Research Assistant Lauren with the interns. We're at Base Camp Kalinda, and we don't see you. What's your location? Over. Hi there. 
It's good to hear from you. You too. I was trying to wait for you guys, but I just saw the coolest thing ahead in the bra. <gasps> really where? I had to follow it to see what Can it I'll was. You guys have got to get up there. It's incredible. Ten four, Professor, we will head on that way. All right, Liz, whenever you are ready, we'll go ahead and move forward and try and find what that professor was trying to look was looking for. Now, I think I do have a bit of a clue, though. We have been tracking an Okapi in this area for the past couple of weeks. Has anyone ever heard of an Okapi before? No. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we'll be lucky enough to find one. Okapis were not recognized by Western science until 1901, and a picture of them was not taken out in the wild until 2008. Now, you can tell if an Okapi's been in the area by taking a look at the trunks of the trees. You'll notice that they have a bit of a red hue to them. This is from the Okapi. They can also spray urine and emit a tar-like substance from between their toes, all to help mark their territory. Now, Okapis are solitary animals, meaning that they prefer to live alone, so this is how they communicate with each other. Now, it does look like we are going to be able to spot our Okapi friend right here. Now, just by the looks of him, can any of you guess what his closest living relative may be? Any guesses? Very close. It's actually a giraffe. You can tell because they share characteristics like a 16 to 18 inch long tongue and ossicones on the top of its head. So don't let the zebra party pants fool you. We're going to let him live his best solitary life and move on to a much more social animal, a pack of African painted dogs. African painted dogs can live in packs of up to 40 individuals. Here in the Havari Preserve, we do have a trio of sisters kind of lying down over here. They're down here. These guys ahead. communicate by high-pitched chirps and squeaks, almost like a dog squeaky toy or a bird. Helps to contribute to their incredible hunting success rate. African painted dogs catch their prey over 80% of the time, compared to a lion that only catches their prey about 20% of the time. African painted dogs also prefer to exude all of their energy while they're hunting, so they will spend most of their day taking a nap. Now this red shady structure right here is the Rhino Night House, which means that we are coming up to Base Camp Ward. This is where Professor Ron works with the International Rhino Foundation to help conserve and protect all wild rhino species. So let's see if we can catch on up with him here and oh goodness you guys, I don't see him here either. Looks like his chair got knocked over and that's his favorite hat. I'm gonna give him a call and make sure he's okay. Professor Ron, this is research assistant Lauren with the interns. We're at Base Camp Ward and it looks like you left in a hurry. Are you okay? Over. I'm doing great. Okay, good. I was just checking in on our pack of painted dogs, and I saw the most amazing thing. Hmm. They started to chase their prey at 40 miles per hour, and I ran to catch up. Oh, my hat must have fallen behind. Thought I might have better luck if I just jumped in my research mobile, so I drove ahead. Hope I don't crash. <laughs> <Get> it? <laughs> Oh, I get it, Professor. I'll make sure to pass that one on to the interns. Now, a group of animals can be called a bunch of different things. A group of starfish is called a constellation. A group of flamingos is called a flamboyant. A group of zebras is called a dazzle. A group of pandas is called an embarrassment. Don't believe me? Look that one up later. Now, can any of you guess what a group of rhinos might be called? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a C. A crash! Way to go! We have some smart interns! Now, while most rhino species are solitary, southern white rhinos, which are the ones we're going to see up ahead, are the most social, living in groups or crashes of up to 15 individuals. Here on the Habari Preserve, we do have a crash of six. Rhinos can communicate by snorting, grunting. Sometimes they will even scream at each other. Another way that they like to communicate are through these little divots you'll see here in the ground. These are known as middens, or informally known as community bathrooms. Rhinos can go up, take a sniff. If they're feeling adventurous, they may take a look. And they'll be able to identify what rhino is there, if they're male or female, if they're pregnant or not, or if they are single and ready to rhino mingle. Hey, hey. Now right on over there is the newest member of our crash, that is baby Jeruba. She's about 18 months old. I do need everyone to stay seated as the vehicle is moving. There we go. 
We do have another mom and daughter pair right here. This is Kadogo and Kayan. Some of you guys may recognize Kayan if you've seen the show Secrets of the Zoo Tampa. She was the calf born on the show. Alrighty. Now if you take a look at all of their horns, you'll notice that all their horns are different. That's because our rhino horns are made of something called keratin. It's the same thing that our hair and our fingernails are made out of. Now they don't necessarily make industrial size rhino nail files, so they do have to use other things around them to help file down their horns. They can use things like trees or hard rocks. Sometimes they'll use man-made structures like fence posts or, do you see something? <gasps> oh no, you guys, this Professor Ron's research took it. Looks like the rhino's got a hold of it. Everyone look at the cute baby rhino. Professor Ron, this is research assistant Ron with the interns. We found your research truck. Are you okay? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. The rhino decided to use my research mobile to file their hole. They got a little overzealous, and one of them punctured my tire. I went the rest of the way on foot. I must have left my binoculars behind by accident. Oh no! But I definitely did not need them to see the animal up ahead. It's huge! I'm almost back to the loading dock, so I should see you guys there soon. Over! Tim for Professor, we're going to take a shortcut through elephant country. All right, Liz, whenever you're ready, we'll go ahead and move forward and introduce our interns to our herd of African bush elephants. African bush elephants are the largest land mammals in the world, weighing up to 14,000 pounds. That's more than this truck and all of us on it combined. Elephants are also very social animals. They prefer to live in matriarchal herds, consisting of a matriarch, which is the oldest and wisest female, her daughters, her granddaughters, 